God bless you. You are on in the AM with Bishop Robert Johnson and Spiritual Warfare of the Power of the Gospel Group. Amen. We are on this morning to minister to our brothers and sisters who are in distant places, distant land, distant country, but yet the gospel is still the same. Amen. So we thank God for you being on this morning with us. Amen. We want to minister a word today for those who are upholding the standard of holiness and the gospel of Jesus Christ. God bless you for tuning in this morning with us. We are so excited. And we're going to minister from the subject, spiritual warfare. It seems so simple and yet so easy. Yet it is difficult for many because at times we find it hard to truly understand what spiritual warfare is. And man, there are so many people today who are seeking after demonic possession to heal or to deliver many. But spiritual warfare is just simply producing kingdom covenant people through the spirit of God. Amen. Spiritual warfare at times will take you being attacked because you trust God. Amen. Spiritual warfare at times will cause you to go through things because of God. So what we want you to do today, we're in the studio. We want you to follow along with us. Amen. As we present spiritual warfare, you can also see this on our YouTube channel. It will be on our YouTube channel. Amen. For you to view. And amen. The YouTube channel is Real Talk Broadcast Network on YouTube. That is our brand, Real Talk Broadcast Network on YouTube. Amen. Again, the Power of the Gospel Facebook group. We thank you for watching this broadcast live or for those who will see it later. Amen. We thank you for watching this video. So let's get into it. Amen. Let's get into our first scripture. Amen. We're going to go away and we'll be right back. Amen. Our first scripture tonight comes from John 14 to 6. I think this is critical to get into because there are so many people who don't understand the difference between the spirit and the flesh. Amen. God said that he removed the first man, Adam. Amen. And the second man, Adam, was made a quickening spirit from above. He was the Lord from heaven. So then in order for that to happen, there had to be a conduit in regards to the flesh and the spirit. Jesus Christ was the son of David, according to the flesh, the promise of God. And yet he was the son of God, according to the spirit. Oftentimes you hear him mentioned as the son or the seed of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But the purpose of the man Jesus was is to restore the kingdom of God back to himself through the blood offering of the man Jesus. Amen. So let's get in it tonight here because I want to show you something that's very interesting and important, I believe. Amen. In John, the gospel according to John 14 and 2, 6, here's something that's critical. John, uh, unlike the other disciples, deals with the deity of Jesus. He deals with his humanity and his God-likeness, him being God. Amen. So he calls or he deals with him as the God-man. Um, if you look at John in John 1, 1, it's safe to say that this same Jesus was the Father in creation, the Son in redemption, and the Holy Ghost in the church today. And man, this great debate or subject has gone on for years, the substance of Jesus and who and what he is. And 325 AD at the council, or yes, 325 AD at the council of Nicaea, when Constantine called the meeting after he took over the eastern and the western provinces of Rome, when he defeated Lucius, 
he had a meeting of several hundred bishops. Amen. And one, one of the reasons they had this meeting, there was a man there by the name of Arius, and he developed an, uh, a concept called, or theology, not even theology, a concept called Arianism. And Arianism simply suggested that God and Jesus were not of the same substance. Um, after several hours or days, they ousted him um, for his um, teachings that they could not embrace it. But there were another group of Jews there called Orthodox Jewish bishops. And these individuals suggested and came to the understanding that God and Jesus are of the same substance. Um, from a perspective of oneness, they were considered to be three persons of what we know as the Godhead. But there were another group of bishops there called, or from the perspective of Homo Eusius. Homo simply meaning the same kind or the same understanding. And these bishops said that, yes, they did agree with the Orthodox bishop. And they can, later on, they came up with the Apostolic Creed. Um, but what they agreed with is that God and Jesus are the same substance, yet they are not three persons, but they are three manifestations of the Spirit of God. So then in John 14, 2, 6, we see that God says, but the Comforter, which the Holy Ghost, who the Father will send in my name. And if we look at that from a, a theological perspective, it would be difficult for a lot of individuals because they want to separate it. So today, I don't want to get into that. I want to deal with one word, spirit. Amen. Because that's going to go with what we're dealing with this morning on spiritual warfare. So watch me, follow me. But the Comforter, which the Holy Ghost, who the Father will send in my name. Watch this now. There is a declarative statement here based on one word. He shall teach you all things. So the Holy Spirit is not an it. It is not a they or the. It is a he. Uh, some people say he is the third person of the Godhead. I'm not going to get into that, but I will say he is Jesus Christ, God in the spirit, God in the flesh. The God man. So 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 watch this. That same man Jesus says he has to go away. In other words, he has to yield and give up the ghost which he did on the cross. Consider at the Jordan baptism of Jesus, the Bible declares when Jesus comes out of the water, and when he declares that the Holy Spirit, first there is a voice heard, then he declares that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus as a dove. Amen. But here he says, I want to deal with one thing. He said, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Remember that. That's critical where we're going. Please keep that, that the Holy Ghost will bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Jesus Christ says in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, he said that the image or the law itself was not the very thing. It was only an image of the good thing which was to come, the Spirit of God in Jesus Christ. So then in 10 Hebrews 10, 7, Jesus said, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book uh, to do thy will. It is written in me to do thy will, O God. But there's something else that we want to see here that I believe is profound as we go along. So follow, follow, let me, let me go back. Please follow me. This is critical. I'm sorry, I missed slides. So the next slide then, because when Jesus dies on the cross, he gives up the ghost. Then the ghost now goes into the spirit of God, goes into the world. Amen. Revelation, the fifth chapter says the seven spirits of God were sent forth into the world in the man Jesus. The, ful the fulfillment of the completion of God, because in Revelation 5, it said there, there was no one found worthy in heaven, in the earth or under the earth. So then God steps out of glory into humanity, wraps himself in a body, amen, and miraculously there is a virgin who is pregnant by the name of Mary, yet Mary is not con does not conceive by her husband Joseph, but that which she is birthed of is by the Holy Spirit. So then the child, if he takes the attributes of his father, can, can be nothing more than the Holy Spirit. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. So then, if we go to Acts now, 1 and 8, 
Now you and I are becoming witnesses of God's word. In order to become a witness, we need to have the parallel understanding that the man Jesus did while he walked on earth. That's why the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Follow me now here. God's in the book of Acts when we deal, we are dealing with the Jews who come into the conception or the understanding of divine spirit based on God's promise to Joel in the prophet in Joel 2.28 when he says, in the last day, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, means to minister. But the Bible also declares, as Christ has suffered in the flesh, to arm yourself likewise. Then if that is the key, how did Jesus Christ overcome? Because as a man, he had the attributes and the spirit of God. So then in order for you and I to overcome the things of the world, we need the attributes and the spirit of God. So then in Acts 1 and 8, God said, but you shall receive power after that that the Holy Spirit is come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both. What's the key word? Witnesses. What am I a witness of? I'm a witness of the power of God, the gospel, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So one who is not a blood was born again believer who does not possess the spirit of God cannot operate or walk in the things of God. Amen. We're coming back on now. So please follow us here in Ephesians 10. So now after he says we get or we receive the power of his spirit in Ephesians 6 and 10, he declares, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Here within the sentence and its structure, he never mentions the individual who would carry the spirit of God. He just declares in the opening statement, finally, my brother, a brother of someone who is born again, woman or man, according to the will of the spirit. Amen. That's why Jesus, God sent Jesus to die so you and I could have access to the spirit of God. So then Paul declares, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I mean, I want to teach something real quick. In the Old Testament, there's something called the prophetic voice. And the prophetic voice is the signature of God. Yet there must be a confirmation of what God wrote. In other words, if he wrote a letter without signing it, it would be void. But then we know that God said that his word would not go out and return void. Then anywhere you read in the Old Testament, the voice of God, or you hear or see God's letter in the New Testament, We'll find the confirmation of Jesus citing it. An example would be Isaiah 9 and 6. Unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Now we will find the signature written in the synoptic gospels in the book of Matthew 121. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So then we need to find the Old Testament statement to go with where we are now in Ephesians 6 and 10. So if we go to the book of Zechariah and we go to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, he says, God says, then he answered and spake, saying, this is the word of the Lord. Here we go again. This is the word of the Lord, also the spirit of God moving and speaking until Zerubbabel, saying, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord. That is the letter. But when we go back over to the Old Testament, we see Paul agreeing and signing the letter by saying, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He tells them then to put on the entire armor of God. And if you know anything about God's armor, it does not have the back access of protection because God does not call for the believer to turn 
around. That's what the Bible said. He that put his hand to the gospel plow and look it back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Then God does not need you to fight. He only needs you to stand. What are you standing in, child of God? You are standing in his word. And if you're standing in the word, the enemy cannot overtake you. There are three places that the enemy desires to, to attack you. The first one is the mind. Why the mind? Because the mind is the principal thing in which we hear and speak with God through our mind, not our physical attributes, the spirit of God in our mind. The second place that he seeks or desires to attack is your heart. And if he can get your heart, child of God, amen, the Bible says God, the heart, for wherein or therein are the issues of life. Everything about a person who, what you are, is in the heart. Then the third place he seeks to attack is your mouth. Why the mouth? Because the Bible declares that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Uh, and so you, whatever you eat, it was going to come out of you. So then he wants to attack your mind because if your mind is polluted, and how can your mind get polluted? Because the Bible says in 1 John, all that is in this world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, and the Father is not entered. So then if the enemy can get in your mind, then he can transfer those thoughts to your heart, and then what your heart does, transfer to your utterance. And if you if you doubt or if you don't believe God, what he wants to do is steal your faith or steal your trust in God's word. We're almost done. Let me go here right quick. We're almost done. Second Corinthians, to verify where we are, says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing, and watch this, every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge. Here we go again. The knowledge. What do you get? What do you store knowledge in your mind against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought, all right, to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to avenge all disobedience when your disobedience is for obedience is fulfilled. So then I need you to understand the enemy wants to develop a character within you to where you won't trust God. We're almost finished. Then I want to give you an example. If we go to the book of Acts, the 16th chapter, the Bible declares that there was a young lady. Now, remember in Zechariah, the Bible said it's not by might. You can't fight the devil with your fist. He said, but it's by not by it's not by might, nor by power. I don't care how big you are. If you buffed, if you've been lifting weight, you cannot whip the enemy because you can't see him. How can you fight what you can't see? So then the Bible declares that there is a young lady in the book of Acts, the 16th chapter. The Bible declares that she followed Paul and them around for several days. And the Bible declares that Paul became grieved and he got upset. Remember the Bible says in John 14, 26, that God was going to leave his spirit in his name. So then the Bible declares in Acts the 16th chapter that Paul was grieved and turned to the spirit and commanded that it come out in the name of Jesus. Why in the name of Jesus? Because the name of Jesus represented the spirit of God here on earth. That's why Acts 4 and 12 says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name, no other name, given unto heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved. So then Paul is operating in the spirit when he challenges and tells the, and tells the demon to come out of the young lady. Child of God, I thank you for tuning in tonight. Amen. You will have other series, other tapes, other things going on that will bless you. So make sure you stay tuned in. Make sure you stay tuned in. We thank God for you. And we thank God for what he's doing. You know what? Invite somebody to join the power of the gospel Facebook group. We love you. Jesus name.